right. Um, yes. Um, yeah, my name is Andy. I'm with uh, the Reed Cooperative in Innsbruck, uh, Austria. Uh, and we're the developers and um, providers of the Transcriber software and its surrounding uh, software ecosystem. Um, I'm to, uh, going to talk about uh, the topic of uh, ground truth and model sharing in Transcribers because, uh, yeah, Transcribers is a, a software suite, you could call it already, uh, for uh, handwritten text recognition, but also printed text recognition it can be used for. Uh, and it's very community driven. So people can uh, train their own models uh, and also use the models of other people. We also do featured models as a company where we uh, combine ground truth uh, that has been uh, uploaded by the community to produce models that um, yeah, benefit to everyone. Um, yeah, and I would like to talk about um, somewhat ethical um, aspects of data sharing and how we handle this in terms of uh, policy. So how uh, does a read co uh, share uh, data through transcribers? How is it, uh, uh, what kinds of sharing are enabled and which ones aren't and why not? That's basically the, the topic that I'm going to be talking uh, about here today. So uh, let's dive right in. Um, the, the first type of aspects that I would like to talk about is economic uh, aspects uh, of data sharing. Uh, and the, the first aspect here is fairness and the ability to sustain, your, to sustain yourself because data sharing is always about giving something away to someone else. And uh, the question is on what conditions uh, do you do this? Here I brought a, a quote from a famous uh, British author, Daniel Defoe, who said, one man studies seven year to bring a finished piece into the world and a pirate printer reprints his copy immediately and sells it for a quarter of the price. These things call for an act of parliament. And this is from the early 18th uh, century where the copyright uh, discussion really gained steam. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, that he basically advocates a somewhat restrictive system of uh, sharing in this in this concept of uh, artistic works. This uh, in the event then led to the basically first copyright bill of the world. And uh, this was entitled the bill for the encouragement of learning and uh, for securing the property of copies of books to the rightful owners thereof. And especially this um, encouragement of learning part is very interesting. So uh, he saw the, the kind of value that could only uh, arise if you had some sort of control uh, over the data, basically, in this case, uh, artistic works. So uh, we're not talking uh, specifically about copyright here today, but it's a very uh, related topic. So it has uh, a lot in common with um, data sharing in general. Uh, yeah, and how does uh, the Read Cooperative uh, and the Transcriber software uh, handle this? We enable um, uh, sharing uh, as much as possible, but try to retain as much control as is necessary. Uh, and this control in turn is control itself democratically because we are a cooperative. That means we have our members, they elect the board. And with this, you have a sort of external uh, control uh, instance, again, that is uh, the basis of this um, yeah, cooperative. Um, yeah, and uh, what uh, can be shared and what cannot be shared and in what way can it be shared? Um, basically, the, the part that the cooperative con and contributes as a company now, and that's the infrastructure and the compute power that goes into training the models. Uh, that's, uh, that's the part that is controlled. So you can share your models with uh, other people, but only within the platform. Um, what is not controlled is the ground truth data, because that's the part that you yourself as a user contribute. Uh, and you can uh, export this freely uh, out of the, the ecosystem again. So it's about who contributed what to the, to the overall um, uh, enterprise, you could say. Uh, and based on that, we decided to set up this uh, sharing policy. 
Then um, another important aspect, economic aspect here. Um, yeah, this policy also serves, of course, uh, the the basis of existence of the of the cooperative because it's a a company that needs to um, yeah gain uh, revenues in order to uh, uphold all the infrastructure and further develop the technology, etc. So that was what the uh, first uh, aspect here uh, was about. So the ability to sustain yourself also as a company. Uh, the second uh, economic aspect that I would like to talk about um, is uh, what you can uh, achieve together. Uh, yeah, uh, and as a large uh, association of stakeholders that the cooperative is working to, towards a common goal can achieve a lot. As you can see here with uh, one of the most recent uh, technological um, additions that we made to the software. This is a transformer based uh, model. I thought this was a nice way of showing um, what uh, this putting together of many people's efforts can achieve. The PyLiar models uh, here are trained on the same uh, ground truth data. PyLiar is uh, uh, the older engine that uh, runs in the software and the transformer based one uh, is a newer one that we just recently added. Uh, and you can see here that uh, putting a, together a lot of different ground truth can produce models that work very well out of the box and that you can basically throw anything that's written in any European language at it and it will uh, provide a decent uh, character error rate. So that's uh, the uh, erroneous characters per 100 characters. And here you can see a breakdown of this sample of 297 pages. Uh, how they uh, are in this basically histogram, uh, how they are distributed. So um, yeah, we have around 20 pages that are below a character rate of uh, 4%. Uh, percent. Uh, and you can see that the new technology outperforms the old one. The main thing that I want to show here is uh, that you can get a, a pretty good uh, recognition rate uh, on a very diverse um, set uh, test set due to many people contributing to uh, this um, endeavor. So sharing data and pooling it. So sharing can also lead to pooling. Uh, this can uh, provide a very good uh, technological solution for everybody involved. Then um, let's move to the next category, the second category, that's uh, societal uh, aspects. Here, uh, what I would like to uh, provide as a stimulus uh, or food for thought is um, a little bit uh, uh, about the ideas of property. So how do we think about property and how does that concern uh, sharing? We have here basically two uh, fundamental ideas. One is uh, American uh, utilitarianism uh, and uh, the concept of eminent domain, which basically means who can uh, make the best use of a uh, resource in the interests of everybody has the, the strongest claim to that resource. In this case, it's uh, the state. Uh, and opposed to that is the French um, and especially Napoleonic uh, idea of property <clears throat> uh, as an inalienable uh, uh, right um, that's tied to a person. To a person. That's also based on, on Roman uh, law. So we have this continental European idea and this more Anglo-Saxon idea, uh, which differ um, fundamentally. The one is about uh, how or what to do with the resource. And the other one is who is entitled to this resource uh, due to a fundamental right. So these are two quite different uh, approaches. Uh, and yeah, that's also the reason for uh, the two systems of copyright and author's rights. So in, in Europe, we have author's rights where you think about who does this belong to? What person is this tied to? What person is entitled to something? Whereas with copyright, you think about who is allowed to do something with that. So the one type of uh, thinking about property is about action and the other one is uh, about um, a person more. Um, yeah, and uh, this uh, ties in nicely with what I said before. Uh, if you pool your resources, 
then you can do a lot more. And that means uh, sharing data in the form of pooling uh, can uh, mean that uh, some sort of control over this data is also justified in the interest of the whole group. Uh, the second uh, societal aspect I would like to talk about is sustainability, um, because uh, digitalization um, and especially digitization so scanning and making uh, searchable uh, of historical documents, they uh, are very service uh, dependent. And this is something that still hasn't hasn't reached many archives and, and uh, yeah, LAM institutions in, in general, that uh, this is a new way of doing things. You get uh, lots and lots of advantages, technological ones, for example, the ability to search large amounts of data very quickly and efficiently uh, and do very advanced research on them on the one hand, but on the other hand, you have to uphold a, co a continuous service as opposed to sticking a lot of books uh, in a cellar or on a basement. Uh, or in a basement. Uh, yeah, so um, also in the sense of uh, sustainability and um, being able to have uh, access to our pasts uh, for a longer time and in a more efficient way, it makes sense to share data, but also to pull them. So this combination of uh, control over data and freedom of sharing uh, makes sense here too. Uh, the third um, societal aspect is uh, uh, one that's based on systems theory. Uh, I looked a little bit at uh, how this ties in with centralization or decentralization. And here again, we can see that uh, complete decentralization, which is often demanded by some initiatives that data should be free and there should be no restrictions whatsoever on data sharing, uh, that this basically wouldn't really work because you need some sort, uh, some degree of centralization in order to uh, provide the infrastructure for any system. And this may be the Web3 infrastructure that is just um, uh, on the rise, uh, or it may be the example of the human brain. The human brain has billions of neurons, but they are organized in more centralized areas that perform specific tasks. And yeah, so they are also similar in a way because uh, the internet needs uh, ISP nodes. So the internet service providers that provide the infrastructure and this enables a decentralized system of sharing uh, information. And powerful systems are always a mix of, of those two. Uh, and so the last category is the person related one that I mentioned at the beginning here again we have this um, um, dichotomy be between a more uh, anglo-saxon um, legal practice and a more european uh, european continental one the one uh, is uh, a pre practice and precedent related so you look more about the actions that have happened so far and how, how have we treated them so far uh, plus the very american idea of uh, freedom of speech where you are allowed to do with data many things that you aren't in other countries just due to freedom of speech. So it's all about doing something, rights to do something. Well, whereas in Europe, um, the, the personal rights are more important. So the rights that are tied to you as a, a person from birth, birth, and those rights are often inalienable. Um, yeah, and how does this uh, affect data sharing? Um, it's about um, what do we do with the data about persons that are in the material that we're working on, that we're sharing on, that we are using uh, to create um, models, uh, etc. Um, here, uh, it's yeah, basically a question of uh, what uh, takes uh, precedence here. So, what's uh, what's important? Is it important to advance research and digitization? Or is it important to uh, uh, protect those person's rights, for example, medical records? Those may even go back to uh, the ancestors of people um, because the, the general right of personality expires when you die. But uh, does that mean that your records should be shared uh, openly if there are maybe uh, medical records that uh, provide clues to the health of your descendants. So those are questions that are um, 
often very tricky. And what uh, we at the cooperative use here is a state of the art approach um, to ask the users to respect the existing laws and regulations. And on the other hand, to report violations. And whoever wants um, even more security or uh, more concrete um, rules for uh, how the data are used and shared, uh, with those, we conclude uh, data protection uh, agreements uh, for those who want them. And that's basically what I wanted to talk about. So I wanted to show that there are many questions uh, involved when it comes to data sharing uh, and that it's important to always basically see both sides. So the ones demanding complete freedom of data sharing, and this concerns the both the models um, that have been trained and the ground truth. Uh, that has been created uh, using data sharing as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was my presentation for today. Thank you very much.